Father, we want to thank you for your profound ministry to us through the church. We thank you for even stirring us up uh, this week by way of uh, a loss and by way of a trial. And uh, we pray, Lord, for great grace. Uh, we need grace because we, we, re we really long to, as a church even, rejoice with Michael and as well mourn with the Kiwis family. We want to do both well for your glory and for their, for their ministry, and for their care and comfort. And Lord, who's adequate for these things? We, we see what you've called us to do and to be as your church, and, and um, we can thank you for the trials and the burdens uh, that you have placed in our life that prevent us from loving this life more than eternity. Thank you for calling us to tasks and responsibilities that are beyond our ability so that we could only live by faith. We thank you for how you have orchestrated your grace to, be, to work through the instrument of faith so that we get to be a part of something that you alone can do. And Lord, we, we thank you for the limitless supply of grace that you've promised to us as your children um, to enable us, to empower us. Thank you for the, every command that you've given, every promise that you've given, every warning that you've given, every testimony that you've recorded in your word. It must be met by faith. And so, Lord, if we are going to stand, if we're going to run, if we're going to endure, if we're going to be faithful, if we're going to minister one to another, if we are actually going to hold forth the gospel to a lost and dying world, we, we need more grace. Uh, we, we cry out to you for, for the grace necessary, and we ask that in that very process you would strengthen our faith so that we could believe all that you have said in your word. In your name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. This morning, we are, we're going to take a little break from the Gospel of Mark, and I want to explain why, and I think there's two reasons why, and um, one's the divine reason, and one's the, uh, the human reason. I'll start with the human reason. Uh, the human reason... Um, as I was looking at the schedule, uh, next week in our scripture reading, we are coming up on Psalm 119, and that's exciting. Uh, we're not going to break tradition. We're just going to read the whole psalm, and we are just, you know, that's just, that's awesome, and, uh, and I can't wait for that. Uh, but that also does mean a little bit of a shorter sermon, which uh, is maybe a little bit outside of my gifting. But we'll work on that, and uh, <laughs> we'll get there. Pray for me. Uh, but I am looking forward to actually the assignment given to me, which I love, was to preach a stanza out of Psalm 119. And um, so I'm, it's still kind of a toss-up between Dalit and the Hay stanza. You can vote. You can email me if you want. Um, I probably won't read it. Um, but uh, so... After that, I'm going to be out of the, uh, gone, I'm going to be out of town two out of three weeks following, so um, that'll be a little bit of a break from Mark, and, um, and so in light of that, you've got four weeks away, and, and since last week we finished Mark chapter 3, verse 6, and we're getting ready to launch into the next major section of, of what Mark does in, in chapters 1 through 8, I thought, well, you know, it'd be kind of, this is the right time to just, to, to take a break, and um, there, there had been a text that had been on my heart a text that I kind of wanted to get to, and it, I was thinking about it because for the last five weeks of Mark, we've been looking at what Mark has been doing by way of documenting unbelief, and Mark is, does not need any, he doesn't need any other text to be brought in to balance. He is per, his, his gospel is written perfectly because it's been written by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, and so it's not that it's imbalanced or anything like that, but in my heart, I thought, you know, I also would like to just dive into a text that's on the positive side of faith, uh, promoting what faith actually is and how we would emulate a positive faith. And we've been so benefited by Mark chapter 2, 1 through 3, 6 on, on seeing unbelief uh, that I'd been wanting to get to this text. And so this seemed like the perfect week. So come staff meeting Tuesday morning, I had said, hey, we're going to be in this text. In, in God's providence, um, I could never have known on Tuesday um, what would have happened on 
on Friday. And I just was thinking about that as a church family. You know, that some of you have just, just heard, heard the news about Michael just this morning for perhaps the first time. And, and so here we are, uh, uh, you know, one of us just having lost a husband and, and two of us having lost a dad, um, corporately um, having lost a deacon, and, and individually we've all lost a brother in, in Christ. And I couldn't help but think of God's wisdom in even just directing us to this text, because the text I want to look at this morning is all about faith. It's all about growing in faith. It's all about how we exercise faith, and particularly faith in the face of what seems impossible. And some of the trials and some of the temptations that um, um, you have faced this past week, and some of the trials and temptations that we would face this week can seem impossible. And this becomes a text to help us I want you to turn in your Bibles to Romans chapter 4, verses 16 to 21. Romans chapter 4, verses 16 to 21. The Apostle Paul writes, For this reason it is by faith, in order that it may be in accordance with grace, so that the promise will be guaranteed to all the descendants, not only to those who are of the law, but also to those who are of the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. As it is written, a father of many nations I have made you. In the presence of him whom he believed, even God, who gives life to the dead and calls into being that which does not exist. In hope against hope, he believed so that he might become a father of many nations according to that which had been spoken, so shall your descendants be. Without becoming weak in faith, he contemplated his own body, now as good as dead, since he was about a hundred years old, and the deadness of Sarah's womb. Yet with respect to the promise of God, He did not waver in unbelief, but grew strong in faith, giving glory to God and being fully assured that what God had promised, he was able also to perform. Christian life ebbs and flows to the degree that faith strengths Uh, strengthens and weakens. I mean, to the degree that my faith grows, my life flourishes. To the degree that my faith weakens, my life suffers. And strength and weakness uh, are rooted in relative degrees of faith. Martin Bucer was a church reformer who, he was uh, an Augustinian, uh, I'm sorry, he was actually a Dominican monk, and he, he went and visited the the Augustinians, to hear Martin Luther preach in 1518. And he went over to their, to their monastery. He hears Martin Luther preach about the gospel and preach about why the philosophy of the day was unbiblical. And he repented, and he embraced the gospel as revealed in the New Testament. And he went on to have a, uh, a flourishing ministry, a fruitful ministry in Strasbourg and in England. And Martin, Luther, uh, Martin Bucer wrote a book called uh, Concerning the True Care of, of Christian Souls. And in that book, he had a statement that was pretty simple, pretty profound. All weakness in the Christian life comes from weakness of faith. And all weakness that I experience in my inability at times to deal with temptation or my inability to deal with trial is rooted in a weakness of faith. It comes down to faith, the strength of faith. The presence of faith. And the scriptures are very clear, believers. Our our faith is not static. Faith is not like a quality that you just exist in a certain amount and there's a certain number, like as though there's a meter on your faith and it just sits there. And whatever meter you were given is the meter of faith that you are stuck with. Faith is not static, it's dynamic. We are called to grow in faith. We are called to grow in grace. We are called to increase in faith. 
And let me just show you a few examples in Scripture that talk about where Christians are rebuked for having a too little of faith. And as I read these scriptures, uh, I think every believer here, part of GBC, uh, you're going to immediately resonate with this. And, and I also just want to say, if you're not um, a Christian or if you're, if, you're, if, you're, if you're not a part of GBC and you don't understand faith and you're hearing this for the first time, I'm thrilled you're here. And this is sweet for you to be able to think about what, what is faith? Why do Christians emphasize faith? Uh, but if you are not a Christian, then you don't have faith. You, you, you might be a person of faith. You might have things that you assert to be true. You might have things that you imagine to be true. And you might believe things that other people don't. But just simply believing things that other people don't does not mean you have faith. Faith is taking God at his word. Faith is trusting the Lord who exists and spoke in the scriptures. That's faith. And so when we're talking about a weak faith, we're, we're not talking about the generic worldly sense of just a person of faith who is a well-wisher and is unduly optimistic and just asserts things on their own authority and says, I'm a person of faith, I believe this. And it might be mystical, it might be religious, it might have form to it. Faith is simply taking God at his word. It's believing what he said. So if you're not aware of what God said in his word, you don't have faith. And so for you who are, who are visiting, I'm just thrilled you're here, and I'm glad that you can listen in, and I pray that you would benefit from hearing what the Bible says is so critical about faith so that you could benefit from the gospel. But for the believer, we're, we're diving into Romans 4 so that we could be edified in a week that's been challenging for us as a church. And uh, in a week that, and maybe you're looking at your week and you're thinking, well, my week was relatively easy. But as Christians, we are all tested by, due to our faith, whatever season we're in. The strength of our life depends on the strength of our faith. And so the scriptures are very clear that our, our, our faith is not static, but our faith is often not what it ought to be. Here's a couple of examples in, in Matthew, and just listen, Matthew chapter 6, verse 30, um, Jesus says to those who are anxious, he says, if God so clothes the grass of the field, which is alive today and tomorrow is thrown into the furnace, will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith? And there's this rebuke at the end, in the, right in the middle of the Sermon on the Mount. It's a rebuke to those who he's calling um, um, God's children, and rebuking them for their lack of faith because they are struggling with anxiety. They're anxious, and so there's a lack of faith. There, in other words, there, there could be a presence of faith that would have taken care of and prevented the anxiety. But in the lack of faith and in the diminished faith, anxiety has now sprung its ugly head and plagues their existence. The same thing is, is said in Luke 12, um, he, uh, probably a different sermon, but the same, the same line, you of little faith, he rebukes his listeners. In Matthew chapter 8, verse 26, Jesus said, why are you afraid, you men of little faith? And this is when he's speaking to the fearful disciples on a stormy lake. I mean, they are scared for their life. Uh, water is coming over the, uh, the edge of the boat. And he rebukes them for their little faith. And then he gets up, he rebukes the winds and the sea, and it became perfectly calm. In Matthew 14, verse 31, he speaks to Peter after Peter had actually got out of the boat and started walking toward Jesus when he was walking on the water. And he took his eyes off of Jesus. He starts to look at the wind and the waves, and you remember, he sinks, he starts going under. Immediately, Jesus stretched out his hand and took hold of him and said, you of little faith, why did you doubt? Jesus is not rebuking Peter or those disciples or those who are fearful or those who are anxious as though I'm going to rebuke you for a static quality of faith that God gave you and you had nothing to do with why it was so small. It should have been more. It could have been more. We're responsible to exert more. We must exert more faith. Faith. 
A couple of examples. Remember uh, Mark chapter 9. We're coming to it in our exposition, but this is probably the most famous example. Uh, the father of a son who, who was demon-possessed, and he, he, he asked, Jesus asks him if he believes, and he, he, you know, he even says, if you're willing, you can cast out this demon. And Jesus kind of rebukes him, if you are willing, like seriously, you're asking me if I'm willing, like if I'm able? Like what are you asking me about? And the, Jesus says to him, oh, I'm sorry, the father says back to Jesus, I do believe help my unbelief. And so there was a, a mixture of faith. He believed that Christ was who he said he was. He believed that Jesus had the ability, and yet there was a weakness in the exercising of the faith that was plaguing him, and he recognized it. And where does weak faith go? To the Lord. It goes to the Lord. I believe, but help my unbelief. It becomes very clear in the scriptures that faith is something that is not static. It's something that must grow. And let me give you one more example from the epistles. And this one I want you to look at. Uh, turn in your own Bible to um, 2 Peter chapter 1. 2 Peter chapter 1. And the reason I want you to see this in your own Bible is because I need to jump around a bit in this paragraph. This is an important paragraph for Peter's letter. He's laying out the purpose that he, he wrote this letter to promote and protect a true knowledge of Jesus Christ. And he doesn't want his audience to be unfruitful in their knowledge of Christ. He doesn't want their relationship to Christ to just be flat and stagnant. He wants it to be robustly fruitful. And so he says in chapter 1, verse 5, now for this very reason, applying all diligence in your faith supply moral excellence, and in your moral excellence, supply knowledge. In your knowledge, supply self-control. In your self-control, supply perseverance. In your perseverance, supply godliness. And in your godliness, brotherly kindness. And in your brotherly kindness, supply love. Don't stop there, though. That's, that's where the list ends. But notice what he says about that list in verse 8. For if these qualities are yours, in other words, you must possess them, and he's going to go on to say that this is a qualification for assurance. In other words, if you want to have assurance that you're, you truly know Jesus Christ and that your, your true knowledge of Christ is not just stagnant, it's not, it's not fruitless, you want to know that you have a fruitful, true knowledge of Jesus Christ, then look and examine if you have all of these qualities including the starting point is faith. And then he also says this, if these qualities are yours, in other words, you possess them, and they are increasing, including faith. So our faith ought to be increasing. My faith should be stronger than the day I was converted. It's not static. It's dynamic. And so in Romans chapter 4, we just read a paragraph that gives us an example in the person of Abraham, an example of a man who grew strong in faith. He was strengthened in faith. His faith was put to the test by the most impossible of circumstances, and it actually grew his faith. He continued to exert faith, and it looks so impossible, and it is so impossible for us who are mere men. It's supernatural. It's supernatural. Faith is something that's given to us, and it's something that we must look to the Lord to increase. But when it comes right down to it, Christian, we cannot make excuses for the smallness of our faith. The question becomes, how do I really grow in faith? Uh, I titled this, uh, Flex Faith and Destroy Doubt. Uh, the, the, the picture you get here is, is Abraham is flexing the muscle of, of faith, and he's just attacking doubt, and we've got to learn from his example, how did he do it? And so as we work through this paragraph, I'm just going to make some observations about the nature of faith or about the nature of how Abraham exerted faith so that we can learn how do we really grow in faith? How do we exert faith? How do we flex that faith muscle? How do we silence all doubt, all scrutiny, all arrogance that would actually rise up in my own heart and start to judge the scriptures? You see, as long as I'm willing to examine the scriptures and figure out, in light of my impossible circumstances, do I determine that this is true? I just got swallowed up in doubt. I've got to silence, I've got to repent of that kind of arrogance. 
and come under God's word and take him at his word. I've got to embrace every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. That's faith. Faith is not imagined. It's not mystical. It's not created by me. It's not my own religion. It's taking God at his word. It's outside of me. It comes from a, an infallible source. And so when I take God at his word, even if my faith is weak and only growing, it's sure. It's solid. Even a weak faith that lands on the person of Christ and his finished work of, on the cross and every word that proceeds from God, which is infallible, it's a sure faith. And so here are really seven, seven realities that come out of this paragraph that help us to flex faith. Let's we'll start in verse 16. First thing we see here is we see that faith alone fits with grace. Faith, faith alone is the only instrument that goes along with grace. It's the only thing that works with grace. In other words, if God is going to be gracious, and if he's going to give gracious promises, and if he's going to enable his children to actually obey, and he's going to graciously work through them, the only way that could possibly work is he needs a means that doesn't rest on our ability. It has to be faith. Look at verse 16. For this reason, it is by faith. Well, for what reason? I think it's pointing forward to what he says next. Namely, <laughs> in order that it may be in accordance with grace. <laughs> what he's saying here is that grace and faith are the only things that go together. If, if, if salvation or if promises or if commands, if, they were, if, if God carried out any of that through any other means besides faith, then it would rest on merit. But God is working this out through his grace. It's God's grace, all of it. Faith alone fits with grace. And as we already looked at Second, uh, second Peter, if you remember, Second Peter ends his epistle by saying in chapter 3, verse 18, grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And so we're supposed to grow not only in faith from the beginning of the epistle, we're supposed to grow in grace in chapter 3, verse 18. So our experience of grace ought not to be static either. There is an infinite amount of grace that God is giving to his children. And verse 16 says, for this reason, it is by faith, in order that it may be in accordance with grace. If God was going to empower me to do something uh, more than I have experienced so far, to overcome a bigger trial, to pass a more severe test, to, to face a more difficult temptation, to walk faithfully through a darker chapter of my life, to get the grace that I need to pass that test requires more faith. Take God at his word. Listen. If, if faith, if the promises given weren't resting on God's grace, if the promises given were a puzzle, the illustration I thought of this week is it's like, oh, like a Sudoku puzzle. I thought that was a good illustration because I don't even know how they work. I've just seen people do it on an airplane and it's like there's something's going on over there. It's like a combination of like a bunch of numbers and kaleidoscope and just, yeah, I don't know. It's just crazy. But it looks difficult. I've never done one. I don't know. So imagine the promises of God are some intellectual puzzle that I come to and I, I, get that, I get this promise from God and I have to overcome it. I have to conquer it. I have to intellectually figure it out. Okay, let me just wrap this up with my mind and figure out all that's going on in this promise. Well then, if that's how the promise comes to fruition, then it rests on my intellect. If the promise is something that's given to man, and here we are as Christians trying to honor the Lord, and he's given us these promises, and what's, what, what's, what's, what it's grounded in for its certainty and for its sureness is our ability to bring about the conclusion of that promise in our own circumstances, then it rests on our physical ability or our resources. The promises of God stand on God's grace. Grace. 
And so the only way you can appropriate it, the only way you can benefit from it, the only way God's grace becomes uh, active and effective in our lives is by means of faith. That's it. And that's so helpful for us. It's so helpful for us in trial. It's so helpful in, in temptation because it just immediately, to remember that truth of 16a just starts to kill that tendency that we all naturally have to look within and rely on ourselves. We realize, no, I, I, this is beyond my ability. I need, I need grace. The only means of appropriating grace is faith. I, I got to just take God at his word. That's actually my second point, taking God at his word. In 16b to 17a, notice what Paul goes on to say. He gives us a purpose statement. It's, it's, like, it's like he says in, in 16a, look, faith is the only mechanism. It's the only means that, is, that correlates with grace. And so the result of that is that the promise will be guaranteed. This is the only way God's promises are guaranteed. He guarantees his promises on the basis of his character, on the basis of the fact that he always speaks the truth, and he carries them into fruition on, account, on the basis of his grace. So if, if I were to appropriate, if I were to take a promise of God or a command of God, if I were to take a warning of God, if I were to take a testimony of God, and I were to do anything with it other than believe it, it would not become fulfilled. It wouldn't be obeyed. The, the he, promise wouldn't be fulfilled. The, the warning wouldn't be heeded. It would rest on my ability. But faith gets outside of self, and faith simply takes God at his word. The reason why it's by faith is so that the promise will be guaranteed. That's the only way you have a sure promise. Which promise is Paul thinking of? Notice what he says here in 16. And he's talking about this promise that's given to Abraham. He's going he's to quote it in verse 17, but before we get to the actual quote, he says that this promise is guaranteed to all the seed, not only to those who are of the law, but also to those who are of the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. Now that requires a little bit of explanation. Let me quickly make a comment on that. Paul makes the statement here that this applies not only to those who are of the law, but also to those who are of the faith of Abraham. I don't want, we, we should not be confused with what Paul says in verse 14 when he talks about those who are of the law. Because in verse 14, he says that if those who are of the law are heirs, faith is made void and the promise is nullified. Now that's talking about Jews who live under the law and do not have faith. That's talking about an unbelieving Jew who lives under the Old Testament economy without faith. They are not heirs. The promise is nullified if it's just simply for those who have the law. In verse 16, he turns around and says that the law is guaranteed to all the seed. And then he has those two categories, not only to those who are of the law, but also to those who are of the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. And Paul uses the word us to talk about all Christians. And what he's talking about here is a Gentile who is under the law. He grew up under the law. He's lived under the law. But he has faith, and those who are outside the law, namely a Gentile, who also has faith. And so both categories in verse 16 have faith, and that's why Abraham is the father of us all. Okay, so which promise does Paul have in mind? Verse 17. As it is written, a father of many nations I have made you. This quote comes from Genesis chapter 17, verse 5. And this promise is given to Abraham the very moment that his name was changed from Abram to Abraham. Uh, this is an interesting, interesting moment in Abraham's life because he is promised to be the father of many. Ab Raham is uh, father of many, father of a multitude. And when that promise is made, he has a total of one son one son. That's kind of, a, kind of a rebuke. I mean, he can't even go anywhere without introducing himself as father of a multitude. And, oh, how many kids do you have? Well, one. Hmm. Hmm. Kind of a rebuke there. But God's promise in the same chapter is a father of many nations I have made you. Now, this is profound Faith takes God at his word. 
Abraham, in case you forget, he's going to remind us here in two verses. He's married to a woman who is barren. He has one child. And God says, I made you a father of many nations. So, so what, what's he going to believe? He's going to believe his circumstances? Or he's going to believe the God who speaks something that's completely opposite to his experience? Which is he going to believe? His own interpretation of his experience? Or God's very word? And this is the way it always goes with faith. Faith is strengthened by hearing what God said. Faith grows as we yield to what God said. Faith grows as you silence doubt of your own pride and your own criticism and your own skepticism. And you, you believe, choose to believe what God said over your own interpretation of your experience. Do you remember what Paul writes in Romans 15, 4? He says, For whatever was written in, our, in earlier times was written for our instruction, so that through the perseverance and the encouragement of the Scriptures, we might have hope. And we could distinguish hope and faith a little bit, but they are largely synonymous. Um, hope is the object of your expectation of the fulfillment. Faith is believing that that's reality, even before it's come into fruition. Uh, faith has not yet come sight for, for us who are still here left on earth. But faith and hope come from the scriptures. That is the object of our faith. So when I say, do, are you growing in faith? That doesn't mean you're increasingly mystical. It doesn't mean you're ex increasingly experiential. It means you are increasing in your knowledge of what God said. You are increasing in your yielding to it. And you are increasing on standing on what God said practically in your life. That's the critical issue here. Mispa misplaced faith is absolutely dangerous. It's absolutely dangerous. I came across a, an example of this um, in a Lloyd-Jones sermon. He was talking about the life of Andrew Murray, who was a, a notable pastor in South Africa. You know, you probably you might have read him on prayer, and uh, he just has some great stuff. But there was a tragic chapter in his life where he had misplaced faith because he believed in something so severely that he acted on it, and it had catastrophic effects in the life of his nephew. The story goes, he held the view that Christians should never resort to doctors or to means. He taught that for years, and for years had practiced it. There came a time when he was going out on a preaching tour. He had a nephew who was most anxious to go with him, but the poor fellow suffered from tuberculosis of the lungs. Clearly, he was not in a fit condition to go, so they talked about this, and Andrew Murray said to him, you believe that God can heal you, do you not? The nephew said, yes. Well, said Andrew Murray, let us go to God in faith, believing. So they quoted these passages, and this is from a sermon in Romans 3. So they quoted these passages, and they prayed to God for healing and ended by uh, thanking God. God for the healing with which they knew had already taken place. They, quote, took it by faith, Lloyd-Jones says. That's, that was how they interpreted these verses. So they went off on their tour confident and assured that the young man was totally healed and that all would be well, but in three weeks he was dead. Faith takes God at his word and interprets the meaning of this word according to an interpretation given, us, given to us in his word. And so the question is, what did God mean by what he said? We've got to know that, or else we could have a misplaced faith. Faith takes God at his word. That's it. You or I, we might have crazy and varied experiences. And none of us would be right to doubt anyone else's experience. All that matters is whose interpretation of our experience? God's. I got to take God at his word. I don't even know how to think about myself, my own experience. I don't even know how to think about my own existence. I can't even trust that, more, more sure than I exist, I have a God who spoke in this word. Take him at his word. That's trustworthy. Trustworthy. 
And so in verse 17, Abraham becomes a father of faith because he takes God at his word. And this, this gets more and more profound when you start thinking about it. And I love how Paul just develops Abraham's faith as the example here because this starts to encourage us. And some of you are hearing this and you might be thinking, you know what, John, I'm already feeling or sensing a collision between what I'm experiencing last week or last month and I, what I know to be true in Scripture. And you might already have some of the conflict of maybe an area of unbelief that's still resident in your own heart. And you're thinking, I, because this happened to me, I doubt that God cares for me. Or because I thought I obeyed God and used the means that he gave me for sanctification and I fell into horrendous sin, uh, the Bible must not be true. And so here you might be feeling a little bit of this contention in your own soul between what you know to be true of God's word and an area of eminent unbelief. And Abraham becomes our example because the circumstances get darker and darker and harder and harder and more and more impossible as we follow. And this becomes edifying for us. Verse 17, um, 17b. Faith knows that God's word defines reality. Faith knows that God's word defines reality. Uh, how, how hard do we make our lives by trying to interpret our circumstances on our own? How difficult do we make that? When we've been, we've been given a word from God and this determines reality. Whatever God said is reality. He can't help but speak, and it becomes reality. Notice in 17b, Abraham believed this promise in the presence of him whom he believed, even God. It pictures Abraham in the presence of God, standing before God. And this is how faith works. Faith puts self in front of God's very person as it hears him speaking in his word, in his written word. I take God speaking to me in his written word, and I hear that in God's very presence. God, you are speaking to me. This is reality. You created me. What you just said seems to conflict with my experience. So I silence my experience, and I take God at his word. It seems to be impossible because of what happened prior seems too hard that you're asking this of me, Lord. That, that level of obedience or that particular command or fidelity in that relationship, what? Abraham just pictures himself in God's presence. He hears God speaking before God. He believes that very promise. And notice what it singles out about God's character. He believes in God who gives life to the dead and calls into being that which does not exist. That is so powerful, believers. Our faith may not be strong, but the God in whom we trust is infinite in his power. So when he speaks... As Omri mentioned uh, three weeks ago, when he speaks, let there be light. I mean, what is light? It doesn't even exist when he said that. And non-existent reality obeys his word. It doesn't have any option but to begin to exist because God simply said, let it exist. That's power. So when he says it, it might not have previously existed, but now it exists. So God says, let there be light to a universe that has no light, and suddenly it exists. And do you think it would be different for the commands that he's given to us, or the promises he's given to us, or the warnings he's given to us? It's fact, and it's reality, simply because he said it. Think about Abraham and Isaac on Mount Moriah. And I know that I, do, I don't want to confuse you. I, I do think in 17b here, when it says he gives life to the dead, uh, Paul, go, Paul develops that here in verses 18 and 19. He's talking specifically about uh, the impossibility of Abraham and, Isaac, uh, Abraham and Sarah having, having Isaac. Um, but I also like to, to draw the parallel. I don't think Paul was thinking of this necessarily, but I do like the parallel in Hebrews chapter 11, where it describes Abraham's faith with Isaac on the mountain. In Hebrews 11, verse 17, it says, By faith, when he was tested, offered up Isaac, and he who had received the promises was offering up his only begotten son. It was he to whom it was said, In Isaac your descendants shall be called. 
he considered that God is able to raise people from the dead, from whom he also received him back as a type. So you picture Abraham, you know, if, you, if, you, if your timeline, you might not be familiar with the Genesis timeline, but the, the promise that Paul is highlighting in Romans 4 is Genesis 17. You're going to have a son of promise. When he makes that promise, Abraham is 99, Sarah is 90, Ishmael is 13. Not a, not a coincidental number. He's coming of age, he's a man, he, it's time, here's your heir. And God says to him, when Ishmael is 13, he's not the one He's not the son of promise. It's going to be another. And remember why there even was an Ishmael? (laughs) Because of unbelief. There's this promise that we're going to have a child. (sighs) We're barren. Okay. Fornication. That's our only out. And that was their path. They walked forward in unbelief to try to accomplish the seed promise on their own strength. And so God says to Abraham, nope. Not Ishmael, Isaac. Fast forward five chapters. Take him up on the mountain and kill him. He's the son of promise. Kill him. Okay, now at that point, you put yourself in those sandals, I mean, you got a lot of reasoning to work out. I mean, okay, what does that look like? I got to figure this out. Abraham doesn't try to figure it out. He just says, I know he's the son of promise, and I know I'm supposed to kill him. Um, I guess he's going to raise him from the dead. I don't know. Doesn't matter. I believe. He he didn't get conflicted. He didn't get held back. He didn't get stymied in unbelief. He he wasn't in that uh, gray season of his life for an extended period of deliberation because he just kind of was trying to figure out what obedience would cost him and figure out, is this worth it or not? He just says, okay, God's got 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 a command here. I got a promise here. I'll take them both. God said it. Here we go. And he just believes every promise, obeys every command. I mean, that's faith. That's faith. If you had that press him, Hebrews 11 says, press him, how do you imagine God playing this out? How do you, in your own human reasoning, what do you think is going to happen? He's like, all I can conclude is God's going to raise him from the dead. I don't know, but that's what, I'm moving forward in obedience. <laughs> he believed God, verse 17, who gives life to the dead, who calls into being that which does not exist. When God command something of you, young believer, you might see the commands of scripture and you might be seeing that your entire worldview and all the practices of your life are opposed to the gospel and you're looking at how hard it is to shed one single sin and you think, this is impossible. Remind yourself, this is, you're believing in the God who gives life to the dead and calls into being that which does not exist. For him to give mere mortals like us power over sin when he raised Christ up out of the grave, that is just child's play. He has that ability, and only he has that ability. Number four, faith transcends what is seen. Faith transcends what is seen. Look at verse 18 and 19. In verse 18, Paul writes, In hope against hope he believed, so that he might become a father of many nations. According to that which had been spoken, so shall your descendants be. That's a fulfillment of the promise given back in Genesis 15 uh, that he's going to have seed seed or descendants that outnumber the stars. And he's going to be the father of many nations. So what does he do with that? Does Abraham just close a blind eye to his circumstance? Does he just say uh, unwarranted optimism? Hey, great, cool, awesome. You watch guys operate in faith in the scriptures and you might be tempted to think, oh, but he doesn't understand how difficult it is for me. I remember that. I remember questioning Paul one time reading Romans 6, describing the old man being dead, and I just thought to myself, "Mm, nope, Paul doesn't know how strong those desires are. He's off his rocker. Just questioning him, questioning God's word. Uh, He doesn't understand how difficult this is. Abraham was not closing his eyes to his circumstances. He was very aware. And there's an important lesson here in faith that Abraham considers all that makes that promise in verse 18b an impossibility. Here's, your, your descendants are going to outnumber the stars. 
Well, let's consider the circumstances. He looks around and he realizes, verse 19, without becoming weak in faith, he actually contemplated, he actually took full inventory and considered uh, his own body, now as good as dead since he was about 100, and Genesis 17 says he was 99. And he considered the deadness of Sarah's womb, who was 90. So he's looking at all of that. And, and if that wasn't enough, he's looking at his 13-year-old who came about through fornication. He's looking at the prom- his own name. He's the father of many. Abraham is well past the pro, uh, age of procreation. In fact, the Genesis 11 genealogy, every single male in the Genesis 11 genealogy has a child in, in their 20s or 30s, with the notable exception of Terah, who was 70. Sarah was, and, and, and Abraham's 30 years past that, three decades past that. Sarah is not only past childbearing years, but according to Genesis 11, verse 30, even when she was in childbearing years, she was barren. And so he's considering all of that. And he's looking at that command. And the reasoning of the flesh might say, okay, I have to have another wife. Or even that wouldn't solve the problem. He's 99. There's the, there's the, how do you get around this? Faith. Faith does not close a blind eye to the impossible nature of your circumstance. It actually recognizes it, that it's, it is impossible. And if it was possible on human reasoning or on human ability, it would require no faith. So God puts us in circumstances where the trial, the temptation, the darkness, and the length of the season become so beyond our ability to succeed that we would only be able to look back and say, if there's success, it was God giving it to me through the means of faith. Praise God for those seasons. Praise God for those tests. Here's where we grow weak in faith. This is where we start to strengthen doubt, is particularly in verse 19. We start looking at our interpretation of our circumstances as more sure than God's word. And we just give ourselves so much vain glory when we can look at a clear statement of Scripture and actually castigate it as being false or being impossible or a warning and saying it's overbaked or a, a condemnation of sin and say that's too severe or a list of consequences that come out if we blow off God's word and we say, no, it's not that severe. You're, it, this is too strong, too much. And we start judging Scripture. We just strengthen doubt and weaken faith. Or we actually just say, God made a mistake in his word because it's not proven by my experience. Abraham walked by faith, not by sight. Verse 19 describes the sight. Without becoming weak in faith, he actually considered those circumstances. He's not blind to his circumstances, but he is not walking according to sight. He's not taking inventory according to what he sees. He's not evaluating the circumstances on his own wisdom. Think about times where maybe, uh, Christian, maybe you had a strong and godly ambition dashed. You might think, God doesn't care. And you have to look at First Peter 5, 7, cast all your anxieties on him so that he may exalt you at the proper time because he cares for you. Oh. The Bible says he cares, but I don't know. I'm suspicious. Based on what? You'd question what God says about himself because you don't like your circumstances? It's arrogance. Think about a profound limitation. It could be circumstantial. It could be a lack of spiritual gifting or even a lack of natural ability. In our flesh, we want to say, I hate this limitation. Lord, I could do more for you if I had more abilities. It's not what Paul said. Paul said, I boast in my weakness so that God would get all the glory. We start to question God. He didn't give us the right gifting. He didn't give us the right resources. He didn't give us this or that or whatever. Recently, I was talking with um, Jacob Hantlon, just so encouraged by him describing, you know, kind of giving me an, an update on some of the nature of the trials that they've been walking through that, you know, before I even got here. And um, it was just such a sweet conversation, and as you can imagine. And um, 
he said that at one point, you know, where you're about, they, they, he felt like he was about three layers into this very serious trial of, of very, involving so many people in his family, and he's just said, boy, it just was kind to the Lord, because I felt like I finished a marathon, and then he just said, okay, time to start the Ironman triathlon. And God just says, look, here's what you needed to do. Do you take him at, your, at his word? Or do you grow weary? This is too much. The trial's too hard. It's too strong. You made a mistake to give me this trial this way. Faith is such a powerful thing. I remember I was 22 years old when, when my mom died, and I remember uh, that morning I was in the shower, and I just was standing there just, like, thinking, like, I don't even know, like, like who, who's, who's, who's crossed that threshold? Who's crossed that threshold? Who's, who's going to tell me? What's going on right now in my mom's experience? Who? And I remember just thinking about all I could possibly know is what God told me. I mean, all you have at that moment is faith. I just knew. It's appointed for man once to die. And I saw her faith, and I saw its fruit. And I saw her live for Christ, and I saw her contentment and joy in Christ only increase, even as her earthly existence got narrower and narrower and narrower. What do I possibly have but faith? Faith transcends what is seen, what is felt, what is reasoned, what is experienced, what is sensed. Your sense, your experience, your feelings, your reasonings, what you see, that has to be scrapped at the door. You must interpret that through the lens of faith. Walk by faith, not by sight. Number five, doubt questions God. Verse 20, yet with respect to, with respect to the promise of God, he did not waver in unbelief. He did not waver in unbelief. This word waver uh, has to, a fundamental meaning of to make an evaluation, to judge, to decide. Then it even means to dispute or take an issue with somebody. And then it even means doubting or wavering. And so it's interesting. Paul uses a word here that kind of puts the, the p- person in the position of doubting God's word by way of disputing, by way of evaluating. Doubt is the epitome of arrogance. I mean, to think that we would hear God speak, and he speaks so clearly and so simply. I mean, it might be difficult to obey, and it might blow our minds to see the glory revealed therein, but it's not complex. It's just simple. Here's a promise. Here's a command. Here's a fact. Here's the gospel. It's simple. And doubt is the epitome of arrogance, to think that I would come along, a mere mortal who has sinned against my creator, and I would start questioning, should I consider this to be true? Should I evaluate? Is that true? Is that too strong? Should I come under that? Doubt is the epitome of arrogance for several reasons, and it exalts man in the, in the following ways. So just listen, listen to this list. It exalts my interpretation over God's, because it means I don't agree with what God says about or what he thinks about an issue, like, a, like sin or circumstances or trials or my goals or ambitions. And so I might even get to the point where I think God's word needs to be nuanced, or I wonder if God didn't overspeak, if he exaggerated. It also exalts my experience over God's word. We might be thinking, I've never experienced this before. It hasn't been my experience. It's not going to happen this time. And so we're entitled to question God, whether what he said is true or not, just because it contradicts our experience. Or we exalt human history as a standard for evaluating what God can and cannot do in the future. In other words, he hasn't done that yet, so he won't. This is arrogance. And perhaps one of the most subtle forms of doubt and unbelief occur when, when, my, when I start to trust in my own ability to trust. And believer, maybe that's what's plaguing you this morning. You look at Abraham and look at how he takes God at his word. He's believing in God's promise. He's not trusting in his own ability to exert faith. He's trusting in God's promise. If I start trusting in my ability to exert faith, then I have, a, a, I have, a, a, I have nothing to stand on. 
I can't trust in my ability to exert faith because my, my ability to trust faith is so limited and so flawed. Trust in something infallible, namely what God has said in his word. Uh, there's just two more here. I'll give them to you quickly. Number six, faith glorifies God. Faith alone glorifies God. In verse 20, he says, yet with respect to the promise of God, he did not waver in unbelief, but he grew strong in faith, giving glory to God. And notice, what could give God more glory than to take him at his word? What gives him more glory than to say, I trust God's interpretation, not my own? That's giving God glory. And then finally, number seven, faith is convinced of God's ability. Verse 21, being fully assured that what God had promised, he was able also to perform. How was Abraham fully assured that God was able to do what he had promised? I mean, this is impossible. It's never been done before. It's because Abraham gave glory by trusting that God knew his own ability better than Abraham did. Does, is God able to oversell a promise? I'm going to do this. Uh, God, I don't think you know your, your capabilities. What are we going to do? Rebuke him for not knowing how powerful he is? Are you kidding me? So faith takes every word from God and it embraces it accordingly. It stands on God's testimony. It heeds God's warning. It believes God's promises. It obeys God's commands. It meditates on God's counsel. Christian, you know, when it comes to flexing the muscle of faith, we need to take God at his word. Look to the God of the word, knowing that he does whatever he pleases. He's all-powerful. Look at the word of God, convinced that his word is infallible, and God, the eternal God, cannot lie. It's impossible that he would give us something that's deceptive or wrong in any way. Then combine both of those realities, and you become assured, fully assured, completely convinced that he is able to accomplish whatever he speaks in the face of any death or any aspect of life any trial, any temptation. Humble yourself by taking God at his word and know that his word is more sure than your own existence. Flex faith by believing God's word, especially where it contradicts your own sense and kill doubt by killing arrogance. That's the only way to emulate the faith of Abraham. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for Romans 4 and just the power of faith. Thank you for giving us access to um, your word so that we can take you at your word. We can believe your very word. We can feast our soul on truth and we can believe it. Lord, there is no way we could possibly glorify you or honor you apart from faith. Um, we have nothing to offer you naturally except the liability of our own sin and our own rebellion. So, Lord, thank you for giving us the gospel and for giving us truth so that we can benefit from your glorious provision by means of faith. Lord, we also just long to grow in grace, and I just pray, Lord, that this truth would ground us in every trial and in every temptation. Um, I pray that um, your word would minister in a very profound way, in an intimate way, in a direct way, in a specific way to everyone here. Lord, your spirit is fully adequate to answer that prayer. Um, and so we thank you and praise you for it. In your name we pray. Amen.